It was almost the end of June, and downtown Toronto was like a vegetable steamer. The hot, humid air mixed with the traffic exhaust made every breath nauseating. The crowds, the noise, the constant soap opera vignettes that make up and overwhelm our petty lives made me irritable. I needed to get away to a place where existence was real, direct, and invigorating. The July 1st long weekend was approaching, and I had an escape plan in mind. I was going to return to being a Canadian. Like a wounded tiger going to ground, I needed to escape my tormentors and lose myself in the deep, cool, mosquito-infested forests of my heritage. A lone journey into the wilds, a spirit quest. I had joined an outward bound club in my junior high and for two weeks, three times a year, we went up north. There we learned to bake apple pies in a pit, light a fire with one match, repel off cliffs, make snow shelters, conquer the rope course and canoe. The program was meant to teach us teeny boppers how to become adults by learning self-reliance, leadership, confidence, and toughness. In the summer of my 19th year, my previous experience in the bush got me a dream job with the Toronto Boys Home Outward Bound program. I spent the summer guiding troubled teens through Algonquin Park so that they could discover how different life is outside the city. It had been a year since I had been canoeing in Algonquin, and now I could no longer wait. I made my decision at the last moment. No time to arrange for food and equipment. I would just go and worry about the logistics when I got there. The most important thing was to simply get out of Toronto. After that, the details would work themselves out. I took off work early on Friday and headed to the Greyhound bus station with my backpack. I had packed only the necessities, some clothes and a few survival tools. I boarded the bus, and as we headed out onto Highway 400, I could feel the tension slipping away with the miles we passed. The bus arrived in Huntsville, and I was glad to be there. I loved Huntsville for the quintessential small rural Canadian town it was. I walked from the bus station down Main Street until I was at the end of town. There, I plopped my backpack on the side of the road and held out my thumb. The first ride I got was from a young couple that were heading to Ottawa along Highway 60. There is a certain excitement I always felt driving into the park, seeing the familiar lakes, the trees, the blue sky. I had my face pressed to the glass, yearning to run out and dive into the cool, clear waters of the first lake I saw, to cleanse away the dirt of the city and the psychic residue of clinging, cloying humanity. They dropped me off at the side of the road inside the park. Ah, I said aloud to myself as I stood once again at the edge of Canoe Lake near the Portage store home at last. Blissful solitude awaited me a scant few miles into the bush. I went for a late lunch in the restaurant. I had time. I was here now, and that's all that mattered. Even if it was dark by the time I headed out, I knew my way around these lakes. Everything I need would be available at the outfitters. After lazily finishing my meal and Wandering the shoreline, I finally went to the outfitters to ask for a canoe. They were all out. Of course, stupid me, I slapped my forehead. It was the long weekend, and all the canoes had been reserved weeks in advance. I contemplated hiking in, but I didn't much like that idea. Canoeing was the only way to go. You had mobility, independence, speed, and comfort. I asked if there was any other outfitters around, and one of the helpful clerks in the store phoned another outfitter to ask if they still had canoes available for rent. The good news was that, yes, there was still a couple of canoes available, plus whatever additional supplies I required, and that they would hold the canoe for me till nightfall. 
The clerk gave me directions on how to get there and explained that when I arrived at the dock, I should use the available phone to call for a water taxi to pick me up. I didn't quite understand that part of it, but again, I figured that things would sort themselves out once I got there. I lugged my backpack to the main highway and held out my thumb again. An hour later, I arrived at a deserted dock on Lake Apionongo. There must be some mistake, since there was no sign of an outfitter anywhere. I remembered something about a phone, and when I looked again, sure enough, there was a black phone sheltered under a small homemade birch bark awning attached to a pole at the head of the dock. There was no dial wheel on the phone, although a circular impression indicated where it would be if it had one. The words, Water Taxi, was written in red paint above the phone. I lifted the receiver and shortly heard a ringtone. After fewer than five rings, a man answered the phone. I asked if I was in the right location to rent a canoe, and the man assured me I was, that I was expected, and my canoe was waiting, and that a boat would be by shortly to pick me up. Well, so far so good. I landed on my feet again. Twenty minutes later, a 14-foot aluminum boat, powered by a 25-horsepower 1956 Johnson outboard motor, arrived and a grizzled old man wearing a red plaid lumberjack told me to jump aboard. Ten minutes later, we arrived on a peninsula. There were three docks, a boathouse, and another building with half-cut cedar logs on the outside. Facing the dock was a rusty screen door with Coca-Cola written in red on white across the tin push bar. A long, rusty spring, one end nailed to the wall and the other to the door, kept the screen door closed. It was one of those doors that gave you a satisfying slap when it closed behind you and which served as a notice to the proprietors that someone had come in. The old man that had picked me up in the boat soon followed me into the main store, and I concluded he was the chief cook and bottle washer. "'You're the fellow they called about from the portage store looking to rent a canoe,' said the man, more of a statement than a question. "'Yes, sir.' "'Well, that green one tied next to the dock we came in on is yours. Life jackets are already in there, and you can pick up a paddle.' from the barrel over in the corner. He pointed to two large wooden whiskey barrels that had an assortment of paddles stuck in them. Is there anything else you'll be needing? I'll need some supplies, I said. Right over along the side of that wall, he replied, pointing to the low end of the room. Cans of beef stew, chicken noodle soup, and wieners and beans were stacked on rough-hewn lumber shelves. These were treasures when sitting around a newly lit campfire after a day's rugged enjoyment and effort leaves you with ravenous hunger. Next to the canned foods were freeze-dried meals that were essential for any long journey. But I was only going in for three days, so I could afford to carry the weight of canned food. The only supplies I had brought was coffee, and so I decided to become completely decadent and I added a can of Eagle Brand condensed milk to my basket. Back in the city, the sickly sweet taste would make me cringe, but in the woods, the fat and sugar-rich syrup was exactly what my body craved. I went to the barrel of paddles and chose the traditional Indian paddle, straight with a narrow leaf-shaped blade ending in a point. I wasn't interested in going fast, I was interested in going silent. My bag of supplies packed into my backpack, I paid my bill and headed for the dock. The sun was low on the horizon, and extending my hand and measuring the sun's distance from the horizon, counting one finger for ten minutes of daylight, I predicted I would be in the middle of the lake by sunset. Mistakes in the wild happen when you become overconfident. I knew my way around the park from the portage store well enough, and I knew where I wanted to go, so I did not bring a map with me. 
Now, sitting in the canoe, about to head out into the lake, I realized I had never been to this part of the park before, and I had no idea where I was or where I should go. The old man that had taxied me over and fulfilled my supply requirements was standing on the dock to see me off. I asked him if he had any maps. He answered in the negative and explained that he had been out of maps for two weeks and had already scolded the suppliers over the phone just yesterday for the delay in delivery. But not to worry, he assured me. Simply hug the shoreline to the right until you find the entrance to a small stream. Follow the stream for a couple of miles until you come out into another lake. There, a few hundred yards in front of the stream's opening, I would find a small island that was the first campsite available. Simple enough, I thought, especially for a fearsome woodsman such as I. Things will work themselves out when I get there. I thanked him and put paddle to water. No sooner had I paddled a dozen yards when the old man added one last piece of advice. Oh, and don't be surprised if you meet one of the locals. He'll try and scare you off, but don't pay him no attention. He smiled cryptically. I thought that somewhat strange advice, but soon forgot all about it as I paddled into the sunset. Finally, I was alone, in a canoe on a lake with no other human in sight. I put my paddle across the gunwales and allowed myself to drift. This trip was more than just an escape from the city. It was a religious experience. It was near 1 a.m. when I thought it was time to get my act together and find the damned stream. After paddling into a half dozen dead-end coves and bays, I realized I might have a problem finding the stream in the dark after all. The full moon lit up the forest, but even in daylight it would be difficult to determine between a small cove and the actual entrance to a stream along the wild and craggy shoreline. Not to worry, I thought. Worst case scenario, I sleep a couple hours at the bottom of my canoe and try again at dawn. After three more wrong turns, I came to the mouth of what was undoubtedly a stream. That further in, the horizon line flattened, and the lack of tall trees told me that the creek would enter a swamp. It must be the right place. I switched my paddle style to Indian paddle so that I would not make a sound as I slipped quietly into the swamp. Almost there, and in an hour or so, I would be boiling water for a cup of late-night coffee on the campfire. The narrow creek wound and coiled through the swamp like a labyrinth. The water was clear, and I could easily see the bottom. All around were bulrushes and reeds that rose above me a good three feet, so it was impossible to see more than ten feet ahead. The sky was clear, and the moon directly overhead, so that it made the fog that was flowing like a stream above the water glow with an inner luminescence. The swamp was beautiful, yet as still and quiet as death. Alone with my thoughts, I remembered the first autumn I spent with the Outward Bound Club at a Boy Scout lodge not far from the park. We would all sit around the fire at night, scaring the shit out of each other with ghost stories. There we first heard all the old standards. The ghost that demanded the return of his liver the girl found chewing on a severed hand after a medical school prank goes horribly wrong. The torn-off hook stuck in the car's door handle. Strangely, the most frightening story was also the most ridiculous. This was the swamp monster. Half man, half cow. A government experiment that got loose and now wandered these woods preying on any unfortunate seventh grader caught walking to the outhouse alone. From that night on, going for a late night pee became a team event. What made this story so scary was the absurd half-cow part of it. 
but I suppose it is human nature to believe the big lie, the more outrageous lie than any truth. Gliding silently through the swamp and fog, I thought what a great location this would be to tell a few ghost stories, and I remembered the story of the swamp monster. I could look back and laugh at how frightened we made ourselves then. Now I was a full-grown male human, and what creature was more dangerous than that? However brave I might have been, there was still a part of me that made the decision that if anything looking somewhat like a cow were to come rushing at me through the swamp, I would paddle my stupid ass back to the outfitter's toot suite. Was it mere coincidence that just as I was thinking about the swamp monster, the swamp monster attacked? Breaking the silence like a cannon shot, perhaps twenty feet ahead of me, there was a loud splash of water as though someone had thrown a large rock from a great distance. I could see the plume of water rise above the fog. I had trained myself years earlier not to jump and become startled at sudden noises, and that training did me well, for otherwise I might have tipped the canoe. My first thought was that someone was playing a joke and had tossed a rock to frighten me. I scanned the area, but there was no solid ground anywhere near from which a person could stand and lob a projectile from. That meant there was something in the water just up ahead of me. What could have made such a sound? A bear or a moose would not have made so much noise. No other creature would have either that I could think of. Instinctively the hair rose on the back of my neck. Something's out there, and I don't know what it is. Should I turn back? Then I remembered the old man's cryptic advice on the dock. Don't let him scare you off, he had said. I continued on. Then again, a large splash, this time only ten feet away. But now I knew who the culprit was. I moved on, and then I saw the little rascal swimming up alongside my canoe, and then lifting his tail and slapping the water just two feet away, showering me in the downpour. He was a monster, all right, maybe thirty pounds. He swam up alongside my canoe, preparing to soak me again, and I reached out and gently stroked the wet, greasy fur on his back before he scooted under the water and back to his majestic lodge that I could now see ahead of me. I found the island without further intrigue and spent three glorious days decompressing. I said goodbye to the beaver as I paddled past him on my way out. He replied by slapping the water with his tail.